So I eat no vegetables at all. Um, so my oxalate levels are really low. I'm predicting within the next 10 years, we're gonna pretty much figure out cancer is being caused by lack of sleep uh, and vegetables. Uh, I still go to the gym. I still lift weights. I do the X3, I use the X3. Uh, you showed me how to use it personally when we first met in person in, I think it was August a year, uh, last year? In San Francisco, yes. Yep, and we were both at an event where you were presenting that was $70,000 a person to attend a week-long longevity thing, and so he was there. He's also the inventor of the equipment in OsteoStrong. Have you heard of OsteoStrong? So he created that, so we're gonna talk about bone density. And what I, what I wanna do is get a deeper understanding of uh, a lot of stuff related to health. Now, before we just jump into it, I asked all of you to write down, like, you know, if you could have something happen in your health and fitness, what would it be? Yell out a couple of things or talk into the mic if you got one in front of you. Eat it all, keep fit. Eat it all, keep fit. Eat it all, <laughs> keep fit. Wow, that's a fascinating. There's a lot of guys like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chocolate, bring pizza. Back, bring back the six pack. Bring back the six pack, okay. Lower HRV. HR, lower HRV? Yeah, higher. Higher HRV, okay. Okay. Who else? What else? I like to be able to run a mile in 10 minutes. Be able to run a mile in 10 minutes? I want to deadlift 600 pounds. Deadlift 600 pounds. She wants to feel so damn good. Eight beers with an eight pack. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> you two should hang out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, um, so there's a, there's a lot that can be done, and he'd certainly, you, you know your stuff. So when we were having lunch downstairs, Parth uh, asked you a question, which he says is a great question, and he said, um, you know, what was the domino that happened in your life that caused you to pursue all of this and create what you've created? And then you gave, and uh, you said, first off, that's a great question. Then you gave a pretty awesome answer. So let's start with that. I mean, uh, like you, what, what, let's first say, what have you created? What is it? And then why? How did you get into this? And how, how, however you want to share that, please do. Okay, that is a great question. And uh, smart guy who works for He's you. He's very smart. Yeah, really. So, Okay, there's, there's two things that I've invented. Uh, one is OsteoStrong, the other is X3. They're completely different, but similar logic. So one is for bone, OsteoStrong, that kind of gives it away. X3 is really more about uh, strength and you know, general, general conditioning. Um, so it, the story starts, uh, I got into life sciences basically because my mother was diagnosed with osteoporosis. So, uh, you know, we all have a mother, and you know, when you see your mother in pain or unhappy with her life, you want to do anything you can to fix the problem. I just happen to be, I don't know, confused or dumb enough to try something that nobody had tried before. Uh, so she told me about osteoporosis, and then she also uh, told me a little bit about the drugs that the, her doctor wanted to put her on, and they had horrible side effects, and no guarantee that they'd even work or stop fractures. Uh, by the way, does everybody know what osteoporosis is? Okay. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. it's define it. Smart, smart crew here. Yeah, um, define it. So, uh, it's, the bone becomes more porous, it loses density, and then is more easily fractured. Now, if you're over 50 years old and you have a hip fracture, you have a 50% chance of death within one year based on those complications of the fracture. So basically you fracture, you can't heal because your body doesn't have enough resources to heal like that amount of trauma. Uh, the tensegrity in that joint is thousands of pounds pushing and pulling on each other at the same time, which is why it's very hard to heal and you end up being bedridden and you get pneumonia, you can't move around, you can't clear the fluid out of your lungs and you die from those complications. It's not as scary as breast cancer but it claims just as many lives as breast cancer. So, um, needless to say, my mother was worried, and this is one of those few times where her worry was like, you know, had some foundation, because she worries about all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, my parents gave me a hard time. It's like, you know, when are you gonna like, get married and like have, you know, like a, like a family? And I'm like, I need to find somebody like my mom. And uh, she's right there. Um, that's my wife. Wife, Caroline, yeah. So, uh, 
but you know, I love my mom. I wanted to help her. And so I was like, let me look into this. Like this, this seems to me like a problem of deconditioning. It's not like a virus attacked her bone or something like that. Anything that can be deconditioned can also be reconditioned. And you know, I said this at the World Congress on Osteoporosis after I ended up developing the device, and they all kind of looked at each other like, well, that's obvious. Like, I don't know why we didn't think of that. Uh, but I, I went a complete mechanical approach. So <clears throat> bone density comes from high impact activity. In fact, the minimum dose response for the hip joint to trigger bone growth is 4.2 multiples of body weight. So that's way beyond what weightlifters deal with. So if you want to affect bone and you're going walking or whatever, it's like you're not doing shit. Uh, you, you really have to have these tremendous impact level forces. That's really the only place that people get that. The problem with impact, now the science of impact is great because we have gymnasts and they go through high impact, that's incredible. The problem is gymnasts retire at an average age of 19 because they get pretty banged up from all of these high impact activities. So what was needed was we need the benefits of this high impact without the risks of the high impact. So I built an impact emulation device, four of them actually for four different uh, impact ready positions. So one with the upper extremities, lower extremities, spine and core. Uh, how the body would naturally protect itself. If I'm gonna trip and fall, I put my hands out like this. Back of the hand in line with the clavicle, 120 degree angle from upper to lower arm. So that's how you would protect yourself and coincidentally you can absorb the greatest amount of force here or produce the greatest amount of force here. And there's no difference in the bone mechanics of how that force is absorbed. Mm -hmm. So I knew if we could just emulate this. So, so what I ended up creating is a robotic system that gets the human in exactly the right position to emulate impact and then replicates that because they have a you know, kind of a cloud-based account that they log into. And so the setup is identical every time. So we take that variable out. So it's absolutely laser perfect, the same thing every single time you do it. Uh, then you expose load for just a few seconds. So you're pushing as hard as you can, you create the force. So one thing I also knew was devices that place force on the body, especially at high levels, have insane risk associated with them. Instead, you get the person in the right position, they create the force, and you have the computer system track how much force they're creating. And so the central nervous system is protecting the body. So what I, sometimes I speak to a room full of like elderly deconditioned people, like a retirement community, and they're gonna bust them all over to osteostrong locations afterward. And I say, you know, for those of you who are worried, I say, I want you to hold your fist up like this and think about this. Can you squeeze a fist hard enough to break any of your fingers? And they usually go, hmm, no, I don't think I can. Right, and you can't because of a process called neural inhibition. So your body will shut you down if you're getting close to injuring yourself. And this is true, like if you're sprinting and uh, you hit a piece of ground that's a little uneven and your ankle just twists a little bit, not to the point where it's a problem, but instantly you slow down. And that's neural inhibition is because your body doesn't want you to keep going at full speed because you'll just, you know, face plant. So, that's the process in using the human body for the safety mechanism made it really easy to show this to the FDA and it was like oh well you know this is basically like a muscle testing device but you're using it for the creation of bone density so there's really no issue here so you know we, we got through that hurdle so easily and, you know like I had friends in pharma that are like how did you pull that off? Well, you know, I mean, it's the body protecting itself. So you don't really need to prove much. Uh, so how, how deep do you want me to go into this story? You want me to pause and well, talk about that? Or do you want me to go right into X3? What I, what I would, um, well, let's give everyone information about how do they actually access this and, and what do they do with it. We can come back to that if sure. you prefer. Yeah, if, so, it's, if it's better to talk X3 first, but. No, no, I'll finish up the OsteoStrong uh, stuff. So what happens, I developed a prototype. Uh, my mother went from having, so she was 60 and she kind of had the bones of like a 70 year old. 
Uh, because generally 60 is not really where you get diagnosed with osteoporosis, so she had a T-score of negative two. Uh, within 18 months, she had a T-score of zero, which means the bones of a 30-year-old. Uh, and she was like in her late 60s. And so she was absolutely ecstatic. She didn't need to give up any of the things that she loved, like hiking and gardening and playing tennis. Uh, so I really like preserved the quality of her life. Uh, and, and she ended up being so healthy and so happy. Uh, and then, so I was like, great. If I got my mom to do something, now my, my mother, she exercises in her own way. She plays tennis and she hikes, like I said. But like to actually get her to like do something, that was how I knew that there was a real market here because I can't get my mom to do anything. Let's like exercise. Yeah, it's not a fun activity, she doesn't want to do it. Uh, and she will fight me like you wouldn't believe. So I got her to do this and she was excited about it. She said, I feel so good after this. You know, putting thousands of pounds through her legs for just a couple of seconds and she says, like, it feels great. Like it doesn't, it doesn't hurt or anything. And so, uh, and just to show of hands, who's tried the osteostrong devices? Okay. Yeah, and you guys agree with that? Yeah, it feels fantastic. So, uh, so she was thrilled, and uh, it fixed her problem. And then I filed for patents, and uh, you know, got it all over the world. Partnered with Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, now it's now we have 300 locations in 15 different countries. Uh, we have uh, about six different clinical trials, but. You know, sometimes I meet a physician that's like, well, you know, you need more evidence than this, and it's like. The evidence is the laws of mechanical transduction, which have been understood for over 100 years. So, you know, this is how we build bone. Impact level force, that's all we're doing is providing impact level force. We're just taking the risk out of it. So, um, I mean, there's, there's probably you know, a lot of uh, people in, in, and I would say, the medical industry that don't want things like that because when you have a condition that uh, as many people die from as breast cancer, there's a lot of money to be made there. Interesting, I think I lucked out in that there, there are no patented drugs right now that are popular. Um, there's one, uh, teriparatide, that came out sort of right when mine came out, but then that was shown to cause all types of bone cancer. Uh, so, and they, it got FDA approved, but there's a lot of concerns with it. And so basically you're only prescribed this drug if you're like, if, if you're at a point in your life where your bone density is super low and it doesn't even matter if you get cancer. So like you're nearing the end of life, like a couple years left. It's like, okay, let's just keep this person from having a fragility fracture and if they get cancer, it doesn't matter anyway because something's gonna take them out before that does. Uh, grim reality. You know, mm -hmm. so um, that's that, that's really where where the osteostrong is. Okay, yeah. awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, so X three, uh, you know, there's a whole. We're going to go into weight. So his book, as an example, is weightlifting is a waste of time. <laughs> so is cardio, and there's a better way to have the body you want. I piss off a lot of people with that title. <laughs> of course, and, yeah. and, and every day you piss off a lot of people that see this. Yeah, well, there, I'm, I'm definitely the most hated guy in fitness, but I think it has <laughs> it has half to do with this, and also I have some some people call it extreme views on nutrition. I, I think they make sense, but yeah. and, and I can prove that scientifically. We're gonna get. I want to yeah. hear these too, okay. because that to yeah. me, you know. So, so I, I have one question here that is like, given that many people have emotional and psychological attachments to tra traditional weightlifting, how does uh, this book and how does this methodology balance uh, between evolving fitness science and the cultural significance of weightlifting and different types of exercise? So it's. Uh, you know, even though it may be a better method, just like a QWERTY keyboard mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, if you you can what if you learn how to type the way that you, it's like what four times quicker or something, but most people don't type that way, right? Yeah. So you have a an improved method, but there's this uh, there's this ingrained ingrained way of thinking on it, and there's also you know the dopamine and the different things that come out of just movement and exercise is you know the social aspect of exercise in groups and the way it's done um, so there's that part but then there's but here's the thing if you have a more superior way of building muscle and mm -hmm. strength then let's share with everyone here what that is and how do you do it because i think that would be really valuable for everyone to know yeah so there are quite a few people 
with that psychological disorder that you described where <laughs> they're, well, they're accustomed to doing something a certain way and then they hear about it a more efficient way, but that's not what they're accustomed to doing. And um, a lot of it really has to do with uh, guys, guys who lift a lot of weights, it's like I go through this dangerous process to be strong and uh, sometimes you, you go to like, a, like a, a CrossFit gym and you see guys actually throwing the weights on the ground to like make it louder when it comes crashing the ground and that's really with those, that's, that's their mindset and they're, they're probably never going to be my customer and I wouldn't really want them anyway. Like, fuck those guys, they're fucking idiots. <laughs> like, totally. Like, what a bunch of losers. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just like a mentality you know, where it's we, just like... We're creating some great social media clips yeah, right here. Yeah, right you sure are. Uh, so, <laughs> it's, it's like, it, it, it's so immediately people were just enraged at this title. And it's kind of a clickbait type title, like weightlifting is a waste of time. Well, is it really a waste of time? It wasn't a waste of time until we discovered that variable resistance is a far better approach. Because as I discovered with the bone density research, you're seven times stronger here than you are here. Once you know that, why would you ever lift a weight? It's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. So, um, and the reasons, so, so like, People defend the fitness industry. Oh, well, Arnold would never agree with that statement. And it's like, well, first of all, his son trains exclusively with, uh, with X3. Uh, so fuck you. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, it's amazing how many people will make authoritative statements and have absolutely no clue or say exactly the opposite of the of reality. Uh, I mean, this is like every day. Yeah. Uh, so like, like all day, every day. Like, you know, they, like I get the question, like a professional athlete would never use this. And I've got an athlete wall on the, on the website that shows 60 professional athletes that are all recognizable. And I don't, respond with any words, I just post that picture. <laughs> 60, like, like, you know, like Terrell Owens is using it, like, you know, some like legends of, in the NFL are like exclusively training with this. So, um, well, you know, so let's see, talk about Mike Tyson. Okay, because uh, I think that strength here offers, so uh, that would explain a lot, I think. One of the biggest problems in the fitness industry is people look to the genetic outliers. Like, they look at guys like Mike Tyson and they're like, I want to train like Mike Tyson because he's like super strong. So if I train like him, I'll be just like him. Nah, nah, nah. Todd, can you stand up for a second? Not to put you on the spot or anything. I did not warn Todd I was going to do this to him. Uh, I, I don't know if this is that kind of thing. But, but, so I was, I, like, I, I looked at Todd and I'm like, I bet he has the same exact genetic outlier feature that Mike Tyson does, and he does. So here, here's the difference. You can sit down. I just want everybody to look at you. Uh, so, so the origin of the pectoral is in the middle on the sternum. Everyone's the same. But the insertion point can be different in less than 1% of the population. Uh, so if I stick my arm out here, sorry, no one's right. getting your way, right. but uh, my insertion point is just like what everybody else's is. It's the top of the humerus. So as I move my humerus bone towards the midline of my body, that shortens this muscle. It shortens the pectoral. It's, this is the contraction of the muscle. However, guys like Todd and Mike Tyson, it's at the other end of the bone. So they have a lever built inside their body that is made out of the most elastic material on earth, tendon. So basically when they bring a bar down to do a chest press, they're spring loaded to push the thing right back up. Basically they're doing rubber band training inside their body. So once I realized this, and documented everything, ran it by you know, some of the best physiologists in the world, and they're like, yeah, that's true. Why, why, why are they, I found like maybe 10 publications. Why aren't there more? And it's like, well, it's not a very exciting thing to study because what are we gonna do? Tell everybody that they can't build muscle? 
Well, that would actually be nice because how many, just show of hands, how many people do you know that have spent at least five years doing physical training and look exactly the same? <laughs> Fucking, no, 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 everyone should have their hand up. You guys all know a lot of people like this. Like anybody, so okay, you guys are on your phones. So like it, it's, it's like, it's so obvious. Like when somebody, prote you know, like wants to protect this industry, you're like, well, what about this? It's like, okay. Walk into any gym other than like Gold's Gym in Venice, California. That's where all the steroid using bodybuilders train. Um, other than that one gym, you basically walk into any gym and the people that are in there are no different looking than the people at the Pizza Hut. Now they might have a slightly better hemoglobin A1C, they might have slightly better uh, you know, oxygen usage, uh, a better VO2 max a little bit, but basically it's kind of fat slobs in both places. So, like, I just kind of say it how it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you look at this dynamic and it's like, I'm here saying, you guys are all wasting your time. And they're like, uh, no, we're not. Yeah, you clearly are. So um, I, had to, I had to get over the idea that I, I, I'm not going to offend people. Like, like my marketing is, I try and be as inflammatory as possible <laughs> because you get an emotional reaction. I'd rather have somebody hate me and then watch a couple videos or watch my TED talk and then go, fuck, this guy's right. <laughs> like, motherfucker. And I, I have a lot of people who say like, I, I spent hours writing like hateful blog posts about you until I actually read what you wrote. And now it makes perfect sense. So that, that journey has been very weird. And also, in medicine, uh, the, the, I lucked out, I didn't cross, like I mentioned, I didn't cross over into any, any uh, patented drugs. Uh, that teriparatide one, it basically failed because of all the cancer complications. And the, the, one of the VPs at Eli Lilly took me out to dinner after I did my presentation at the World Congress on Osteoporosis. And he's like, you got a cool thing. Like, this is gonna change millions of lives and there's no side effects to it. So like pharma really didn't get in my way at all. Like they were just kind of like, cheers, bro. This is awesome. So, but Mark, now, now so this, the medical marketing was very easy because all I had to do was show the evidence and the physicians started sending their patients over. Like it was, as soon as I got the evidence, now before the evidence was together, yeah, they did not want to send their patients over. But as soon as I showed them a couple mm -hmm. studies, like that, like, Every osteostrong location was more or less packed. Um, when it comes to fitness, the industry is crazy uh, with people who are just making shit up. Or and you, you know, I mean, like, like I've seen some Bill Phillips ads that you probably designed, and where I look at it and I'm just like. Scientifically, like this is just the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> but you know, sometimes well, I, de I definitely didn't design those. No. Yeah. So no. like, like, like you know, oversimplification is another word for wrong. And some, some of these things. Now, simplification is good. Oversimplification is just, just, I mean, just fucked up. Give, give an know. example. Uh, you know, when somebody says, um, if it fits your macros. That's just a crock of shit. That doesn't matter. Or, oh, um, hydration. You need eight glasses of water a day. Uh, I mean, that's not really an oversimplification. That's just a fucking lie. Uh, brought to you by Gatorade, by the way, because that was started with marketing. A lot of these things mm -hmm. started with marketing. Um, you know, and like even, even Kellogg's breakfast is the most important meal of the day. No, it's not. Like, you can eat at any time and you can assimilate whatever nutrients you're taking in. It does not matter. Like, a lot of days I eat one meal in a day just at the end of the day. Like, it, as long as you get the proper nutrients on the day you train, the body's gonna use those building blocks. And on days you don't train, you don't even need to eat at all. Like, I know intermittent fasting is hard, but if you think about the fact that what you need to fuel what you're doing during the day, if you're having a sedentary day, why not just live on body fat? Why not just live on the Krispy Kreme donut I had when I was eight? 
because it's still on my fat fucking face. So you, you have to, <laughs> you have to look at it like that. Can we, can we grab so, the suit of donut real quick? Yeah. <laughs> no donuts. Yeah. Uh, um, also, like, um, well, I don't, I'm just going to wander. No, no, let me, let me say this. Let's, well, let me say something about marketing, too, because um, like with Bill Phillips, uh, I never wrote sales copy or advertising about what supplement to take, what workouts to do. It was none of that. It was strategic things like multi-sequence mailings, donating money to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. It was, uh, you know, the Evolution Man with Clark Bartram, uh, you know, those things. So I wasn't, tell, I wasn't involved in uh, giving people, like, you know, exercise advice or, or writing advertising copy or anything back then, and this was in the late 90s. And the, the funny thing, though, is that it, it's why today I preach so much about ethical use of marketing. It's why me and uh, Robert Cialdini, uh, you know, who wrote Influence, are such good friends, because we talk about the ethical use of, of marketing, because, you know, hype used ethically is massive enthusiasm for what you're selling. Hype used unethically is lying, misleading, exaggerating, bullshitting, and that's what a lot of it is. So that's why so much of the marketing industry gets a, a bad rap, deservedly, because there's a lot of uh, con artists, you know, and I talk about there's connecting and Especially then there's connecting. Oh, totally. No, totally. Especially fitness. Oh. And, and, and here's the thing about fitness, like I maybe meet one out of a hundred copywriters that write advertising copy for supplements or fitness things that are in good physical shape. Mm -hmm. Like is the funniest thing, like I've met so many people that have written some of the most successful diet campaigns mm. and they are not at all, you know, using yeah. or following any of the advice, but they have the ability to weave together words. They look like Grimace from the McDonald's ads. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I know people that have written super successful advertising campaigns that are horribly out, of, don't even exercise, <laughs> like yeah. at all. They're not just weight yeah. lifting. See, lifting weights is better than people that do nothing at all. So, I, unless yeah. you would have, I'd love to hear your, your perspective no, on that. No, so, I mean, certainly activity is better than no activity. Yeah, so, so, no. so that being said, so what is the X3? Let's talk about this thing. so so when I when I looked at first I was like okay we need to vary the resistance we need the, a resistance that changes so if you're seven times stronger here than here what is the actual curve look like is it 3.5 in the middle turns out it's more like two so the curve really does this so you're super strong here you're sort of you know less than middle here and you're really pathetic here uh, pathetic, I mean, you know, by comparison to what you are actually capable of. Well, so, okay, look, one thing though, so going back to Mike Tyson, Mike mm -hmm. Tyson could, why was Mike Tyson able to just knock people out? Because he had, you know, basically like a rubber band built in his arm, he could, like his style of training, he ducks down really low and gets right up in the face of the opponent, and then he has the ability to hit somebody with full power because he's got this rubber band right here that just fires his arm up so hard he has full power when he's three inches from somebody but his opponent has no power in that position and so he gets inside and you know a couple uppercuts and they're done yep. and, and his, his trainer Customato knew within 30 seconds of watching Mike what that genetic difference was and that Mike actually had like the perfect tendon attachment just like Todd uh, it's really rare. I've met maybe five people uh, in my life, and the other four are in the NFL. That's why I told Todd, I'm like, you probably could have been in the NFL, man. Um, so, and, and the funny thing is, is guys like Todd, like, like some of these NFL guys, like it, what, what got you, you know, I asked, what, what got you interested in just physical activity? And like, oh, I put on 40 pounds of muscle one summer when I was mowing lawns, and you're like. <laughs> This is why nobody should follow genetic outliers. Like, don't try and do Arnold's program. It worked for Arnold because he's got Arnold's genetics. And if, in fact, if, like, you, you, like, you sit down with a couple sports physiologists and analyze what he did, it's like the worst workout program I've ever read. It makes no sense at all. Some of the things like conflict with each other, like some of the things that are like, really like, that's only good to cause injuries. Like, what, what the fuck would you do that for? So. Don't look at the genetic outliers. Look at the people who, like me, for example, I wasted 20 years lifting weights, got nothing out of it, and was absolutely convinced that there's, like, I, I got to find the genetic difference here. 
And, and so I, I was on that path, but as soon as I developed the bone density devices, it's like, fuck, I got it now. Like, I understand this perfectly. So we need massive variance. So a much lighter weight here and a super heavy weight here. So like when I bench press, I have 550 pounds here, but as I lower it, it's 300 pounds here. And at the bottom, it's 175. And so as I'm going through this range of motion, I first go, by the way, the, way, the level of force would be different for everybody. So like my wife does not bench press 550 pounds. Um, you might have known that already, but so I, I go to fatigue in this position, but I still have capability with the lower weight in the weaker position. So then I do a few reps in that sort of mid range, and then I can't use that range of motion anymore. And then the last couple of repetitions are just maybe an inch off my chest with 175 pounds, but now I've simultaneously taken every possible range of motion to fatigue in one set. This is something you can never do with a weight, ever. And that level of fatigue has a massive response. Uh, if you do it correctly, you will grow muscle every time. Uh, now, growing muscle is not a matter of just going and doing the same workout again. So uh, I'm sure everybody's heard the term progressive overload, right? So what that means is, to get stronger, you have to be dealing with a greater level of total work done in a set every time. If not, you didn't really do anything. Now, you might maintain your strength by repeating, you know, whatever sort of what you did last time. Um, and then one of my problems, even with X3, because the first X3 I came up with was a bar, a set of bands, and a ground plate so the, the bands can move under your feet freely uh, and you're not impinging them. Also, you don't want to step on a band because it only takes seven pounds of lateral force to break an ankle. And um, we're dealing with, like in a deadlift, like seven, eight hundred pounds. So you really don't want to be standing on the band. You want the band to be free to move underneath your feet. Uh, so pretty simple, pretty elegant. And then I, I, um, I was like, okay, the only thing missing is we need the data because so many people might be just five pounds away from creating a total force that will trigger growth. But they don't know. Every time you work out, you're basically trying to sprint into a dark room because you don't really know where you're going. You don't really know where that trigger point is to ensure that you will grow. So most people, they might only grow out of 50 or 100 workouts in their life. The rest of the time, they're just repeating what they did or maybe even a little bit less, and they'll never know it. So it's, it's not every time you work out that you actually trigger growth. It's every time you outperform yourself mm -hmm. all time. That's when you trigger growth. That's the only time you trigger growth. And so my, my latest version of the product has a total force tracking capability. So it Bluetooths your phone, you put your phone in front of you, and you guys are gonna see this in a couple minutes. Um, I'll, I'll attempt to create gr uh, a greater amount of force with my biceps than I ever have. Um, but it's very efficient when you have the measurement. You don't need to waste your time by just repeating workouts and hoping, oh, I hope I you know, got a greater level of, right. of total resistance uh, this time because you know, you, now you know. And uh, so, for example, since developing the data tracking, uh, it's, it's called the X3 Force Bar, um, the, I have worked out this year, now I'm, ta I'm talking about not my whole workout, not my resting time in between exercises or the time I spent drinking water or whatever, because you know, I, I do this at, at my office or at home. Um, I've only spent 10 hours and 17 minutes working out this calendar year. I have increased my strength by 600%. And I was already big and strong. So I had already used the analog X3 and that put on 45 pounds of muscle. Um, in fact, if you saw me on my 40th birthday, and you saw me now, you, you wouldn't even think it's like the same guy. Because uh, I was just a, I was a lot less muscular and I was a lot fatter. So like 20 years of lifting weights, I just look like an unimpressive 
fucking average guy. And and now, like, I get stopped in the, you know, the, the grocery store, and people are like, can I, can I get your autograph? And I'm like, who do you think I am? And they're like, I'm pretty sure you're a fighter, or I'm pretty sure you're an NFL player. That's a great feeling. Like, live, you know, because everybody wants to feel like that. Everyone wants, uh, you know, some kid called me Thor the other day. And, you know, and I'm like, I really don't have the hair for that. Uh, but, hey, thanks. And it, it's like, that feels so good. Uh, and I never thought I would ever have that feeling because after, you know, living 40 years, it's like, am I really going to put on a lot of muscle? So I got way better results than I thought I would get. But it turned out that all the science that I put together, all the arguments, all the mathematics uh, that are in the book, Weightlifting is a Waste of Time, it worked exactly like I described it before I had actually even seen it happen. Hmm. Yeah. What what about uh, as you age? So there's there's hormone levels that change. There uh, well the change depends on of course what you ingest, uh, stress level, sleep. I mean there's a million factors. Uh, there's injuries. Uh, let's talk about all of that as it relates to uh, to aging because I, you know what what I like about X3 uh, is for one it's super portable. It takes no space. Yeah. Uh, you can take it pretty much anywhere and. You know, I recently got a storyteller uh, sprinter van, you know, so the <laughs> CEO of Storyteller, Jeffrey Hunter, uh, just joined Genius Network. And there's a thousands of people that I didn't realize this until I went to this big Overland Expo that are, I mean, they're on the road. They yep. li some of them live that way. Some live that way for periods of time. Uh, and and like, how, how do they exercise? A lot right. of them hike, but they have no strength building thing unless they carry around kettlebells and different sort of stuff or do push-ups and my, whatnot. My X3 has uh, traveled 600,000 miles with me because mm -hmm. it just drops right in a suitcase. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 19 and a half inches long, uh, it's a bar, a plate, and four bands. Uh, that's it. And you can, you can double, the, like you can take like the light band and the super heavy one because the light band is kind of like an incremental step, so you can add them together and, uh, and you know, get, get some more progressive uh, resistance that way, but yeah, I mean, it, I didn't really develop it for traveling, but it's like, how simple and elegant can I make this so that it's just right to the point, you're going to be as big and as strong as your genetics will allow you, and you, now you're on this level playing field in terms of building muscle as a, any pro athlete that's absolutely gifted. That's, that's really what it does. It gives you the gift that the NFL player that didn't really have to try all that hard for incredible strength. Now, of course, at some point, they do start training hard uh, and do develop uh, you know, incredibly so. But <clears throat> now we can all do it. Now it's not just a 1%, you know, like gifted athlete kind of thing. And I see people all the time, like guys in their 60s or 70s, or like I put on 20 pounds of muscle. And, you know, you hear that, and they think it's great. But, you know, my response is, do you know anybody that's your age that's done that? And they're like, no. Yeah, right. Neither do I. Except for other X3 users. So, like, like a lot of the things that are happening when we age, um, Testosterone, testosterone replacement therapy. A lot of guys think that's going to be like, you know, oh, it's just like a prescription for steroids. No, uh, it replaces people. People on the internet don't know what the word replacement means, apparently, um, because it's replacing what's supposed to be there. The reason most men over the age of really 35 have low testosterone is really because of some of the processed crap that's in our diets. Uh, you know, all the soy soy products and um, really anything with soy, uh, lectins, uh, um, oxalates and vegetables, um, you know, these are all sort of performance robbing things that damage us from a hormone perspective. And so getting those, those shitty things out of your diet is super important, uh, but also, you know, just optimizing testosterone levels. But it, there's more to the story than just testosterone. Uh, in fact, like like anyone, I don't want to ask, it's kind of embarrassing, but I'm sure there's some people in here that are on testosterone replacement therapy. A lot of people don't really want to talk about it or admit that. Um, so I have testosterone replacement therapy, but I'm at about half the dosage that most people are, intentionally. 
Like my, my doctors want to put me on more and I take 70 milligrams a week. Most people are at 150. Uh, and the reason is I can get more out of that 70 milligrams and have zero side effects. I've never had an estrogen moment. Because like a lot of people who take testosterone, you know, the nipples will start to itch because they're start, starting to grow like breast tissue. Uh, or they get a ton of acne or they have all these other complications, high blood pressure. Um, I don't have those things. And I'm building muscle faster than, you know, people who are even chemically enhanced beyond that point. Um, also, just this is fun cocktail party conversation. Um, most people take about 150 milligrams per week as a replacement dosage. Some of the bodybuilders that have died recently were taking 5,000 milligrams per week. So if you're wondering what the difference is, that's a massive difference. Like uh, Dallas McCarver, 21-year-old bodybuilder, died with 57 times the natural amount of testosterone in his body. He died of chronic heart failure. Now, ironically, the testosterone did not hurt his health at all. His muscle did because the human heart is only designed to pump blood to a certain amount of vascular tissue. In, in a way, a 300 pound obese person is healthier than a 300 pound steroid using bodybuilder because the heart can't pump blood to 300 pounds of vascular tissue, but body fat's not vascular. It just sits there, it's storage. So you gotta think like, you know, really what's the optimum you know, weight for a six foot tall male. It might be a 220 pounds or something like that. But then beyond that, it's like, it's actually the muscle that's giving you cardiac problems. So I, I, I always found that interesting. I lecture on that all the time. You, what you wanna do is get your hormones optimized however that happens. It could be through supplements, it could be through cleaning up your diet, it could be through testosterone replacement. But then the answer is really getting the training right and getting the nutrition right. Because you can go so far by doing those two things and you really don't need to worry about the, uh, the hormonal side so much. Yeah. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. Uh, everyone knows who David Goggins is, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely like an attitude with people who exercise or he's a Navy SEAL, but kind of have to exercise to survive. Um, the whole like, I'm gonna punish myself, I'm gonna go through all kinds of pain. That's great for him because there might have been a day where he had a couple of bullets through him and he had to go home anyway and uh, the enemy's right behind him so he's just got to march. I get that, but you guys will never be in that type of situation, I'm pretty sure. So instead, let's figure out, let's, let's strategize a way where we can get the most force through a muscle to trigger growth and not have to spend a ton of time that we don't need to spend. Like everybody here is busy and everybody is, mm -hmm. everybody's looking for the most effective and efficient solution. So if I can work out, you know, ultimately like a couple minutes a week and get the kind of results that I've had, um, now I couldn't have grown any faster. Now also I do want to point out, it's not everything. Like. Uh, the, the, uh, the Miami Heat is not allowed to lift weights. They just use X3. Uh, so I do the strength programming for those guys. But they still have to do their basketball drills. They still have to do the skill development. They still work on speed and reaction time and all those things. But skill development is really more neurological. It's not strength. Uh, and so it gives you, and this, is, this is where it really wins for pro athletes. Zip it. Okay. They, they do this and it gives them more time and, and more energy because they're not so devastated. Like, I mean now, like I'm breathing normal, I'm fine. And I did my bicep training for the whole week. So uh, it gives an athlete more time to focus on the skill development if they need to do that. So, you know, if somebody wants to throw a javelin further, they're spending more time with the javelin and less time in the weight room and they're still as strong as possible.
Yeah, you know, you're also you're also dealing with like ritualization in, to a degree too. Like, I mean, uh, I, I I like doing yoga simply because more what it does for me mentally than anything. It's supposed to be that way. Yeah, you have the right philosophy. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, people are like, you know, like I, I I do yoga for fitness, and it's just like, <sighs> okay. <laughs> like that's just such a depressing comment, but all right. Yeah, it's, the yoga is about your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, okay, so we have two online. We have one here, so we'll take, uh, we can only do so many. I mean, I'm, I'll apologize in advance because of time, and we're not going to be able to take every question because a bunch of hands just went up, which is good, though. This means you uh, evoke a lot of... Uh, oh, yeah, if people thought, oh, let's fuck this guy, and they wouldn't ask anything. Yeah, <laughs> got it. Yeah, uh, John, I'm curious your, your thoughts on the ARX machine. So the ARX is awesome. It's basically this at like 50 times the price. Or more, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's like, yeah, 54 times the price actually. Yeah, I mean, I think the ARX is awesome. I met the guys from ARX. In fact, um, it, it was just total luck. I was uh, hanging out with Dave Asprey when they were filming some of their uh, like video content with the ARX at his Bulletproof lab. And he had a couple of pro athletes come in and try it, and then when they were done, Dave was like, hey, you want to try John's thing? And he didn't even say it was like variable resistance or anything. And all the athletes were like, I'd way rather have this. Like the ARX is like the size of an automobile. Like I can't take that anywhere, like I can't afford it. Like they're like, hey, where do I get one of those? So I sent them all an X3 and they're all on my website now. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, but I, like the ARX is variable resistance. It's basically exactly what you just saw. It's just done with uh, electric motors instead of uh, latex banding. Yeah, cool. let's do the ones online, and then we can send. Yeah, Dan, and then online, we'll, they just wanted to know if, when do we get it, where uh, do we get it, how much is it? Okay, so they <laughs> online they wanted to know just for. Is that monthly thing? We need microphones, Gina. You should know better. I get it. Uh, so, yeah, where to get it, how to get it. We'll come back to that if you want. You, we can, or tell, right now, well, go Well, yeah, how I mean, do you get this? X3Bar.com, uh, right now the analog bar uh, is available, and in the next few weeks, uh, we, we're gonna have another shipment of um, the Force Bar, what you just saw, the one that Bluetooths to your phone. So, like, for some people, they just don't like smart devices, like, I don't want something connecting to my phone, and, uh, you know, there's, there's other people where it's like, no matter what you give them, like they're not tech savvy enough to really maintain that. Yeah. Uh, and I find that kind of irritating. Yeah, my wife's a perfect example of that. She doesn't want to horse around with the, the data and she gets great results anyway uh, because she really pushes herself. No, I mean, I think sometimes you have to push yourself harder because you're not sure, but you don't really mind. Yeah, so I mean. Yeah, I would say the analog bar is great if you just don't want to dick around with the technology and you want to do exactly what I did in the most simple, streamlined way. But for me, especially after a couple years and putting on 45 pounds of muscle, it's like, well, is this it? Or like, do can I actually progress? And after developing this, and as soon as I started using it, it was like unbelievable. It was what, like I'm growing like a beginner now. What are these selling for now? Uh, $1,000. Okay, for the one with the Bluetooth. Yeah, and it's 550 for the one without the Bluetooth. Okay, so five. Find the 550. It says to get on the list, or whatever. You'll let us know when the one's come out. Or that's right. So that's right. Trying to buy it, and it's it yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What do I do with my old one? Oh. <laughs> you, uh, you're rich already. Are you kidding me? Just give it to a friend. All right. <laughs> so Daniel. So you talk about building muscle. You know, what about getting shredded without mass involved? Is is there just different ways of doing it? Like, so a lot of people when they go to just be lean, like every once in a while we get, well, we get a lot of people that are like, all I really want is a six pack. Mm. Okay. Well, there's a couple problems with that being. A solitary goal. One is when you lose all the weight, you're going to realize you were not nearly as muscular as you thought, and you're going to look like, like, you know, uh, uh, Christian Bale in the mechanic, you know, where he just frail, like falling apart kind of guy. Um, so you don't want to look like that. Also, the more muscle you have, the greater a metabolic engine you have to use the energy that you're taking in with food. So, like, I mean, I don't do any abs. Mm. Uh, like, the ab work is what I just did. Like, I had to stabilize my body. That builds the muscle. But, like, I have a massive metabolic engine. 
So it's easier for me. This, this is a complaint of my wife is she'll say like, you know, why is it so easy for you to like drop body fat? And it's so hard for me. Well, because I got a lot of fucking muscle. It's like a giant engine. It's running all the time, even when I'm sleeping. So can you speak to your diet too? Yeah. So <laughs> this is the other reason people hate me. Um, I really don't eat carbohydrates. Uh, I, I eat, so there's a meta-analysis that came out this year, so this is new information. Um, the maximum amount of carbohydrates that your body can use for muscle glycogen, which is the primary use of, of glycogen, is um, it's your body weight in kilos times 0.3. So I weigh 100 kilos, it's really easy for me. I weigh 100 kilos, so 30 grams of carbohydrates is all, all my body can use to replenish all my muscle glycogen. I try and come in under that number because my body will make up the difference with gluconeogenesis, which is the creation of glucose. But that creation of glucose always has an address, it's demand driven. So for example, if my brain needs some glucose, my body will make it out of protein, create glucose, and send it to my brain so it cannot be stored as body fat, also it cannot feed a cancer cell. A gluconeogenesis is absolutely fucking powerful. And um, you know, the people who, look at you, uh, the people who have beaten cancer, uh, somewhere in the mix was a limitation on carbohydrates. And uh, also there's, there's a lot of great research on glycation uh, you guys should all write that you word down. All protein. Yeah, basically steak. That's it. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. So when I, I spoke about that briefly, wait, Lee is the mic. I'm sorry. Vegetables. So uh, there's a great book. Uh, I'm going to forget the author's name, but it's called Toxic Superfoods. Um, Sally Norton, yeah, it's an amazing, amazing book. Um, she talks about the toxins that are in vegetables. Now, there's a lot of things that look like they're healthy in vegetables. Uh, a lot of micronutrients that we might need or not need. Now, um, according to the uh, American Medical Association, if you were just to eat whole foods, this is a great question, I want, I want, I want some answers here. Uh, if you just to eat whole foods, no supplements, no powders, no pills or anything, um, how many calories would you need to take in to get to your recommended daily allowances ascribed by the American Medical Association? Take a guess. 6,000. 6,000? 6, 2,000. 2,000? Anybody else? 27,000 calories you need to take in every day to get the vitamins that they tell you you need. It's almost like they wrote that to sell fucking vitamin pills, huh? Because no one has ever eaten 27,000 calories. A fucking rhino doesn't eat 27,000 calories, like the stupidest thing ever. Also, this was based on expert opinion, no research, in the 1940s. Like, there is not a shittier recommendation anywhere in medicine compared to what we're told about vegetables and fruit. So I eat no vegetables at all. Um, so my oxalate levels are really low. I'm predicting within the next 10 years, we're gonna pretty much figure out cancer is being caused by lack of sleep uh, and vegetables. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know, you know the, the interesting thing, like I have a, uh, Whitney Jones connected me with a, a guy who's, are you rowdy, vegetable-loving people? All right, so. Uh, you notice Howard's not being disruptive. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? That's great. <laughs> Whatever you talk, just to keep. <laughs> so, um, so I asked him, you know, he's in really great physical shape, and he, he basically said, he goes, yeah, like with vegetables, there's a lot of things that they have to do to fight off predators, and so they produce a lot of toxins with, within them, which is so counterintuitive, right? And uh, well, it's counter to what we've been told. Counter, yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. It's it is intuitive because you ever try and give a kid like some Brussels sprouts, and they want to fight you to the death. It's because they realize it's fucking poison. <laughs> you never you never find a kid that's like, ew, I don't want to eat that chicken or I don't want to eat that steak. Is, she, like, is, is that. Sheila in the room? Remember? Right, okay, so they got uh, her, her and her partner. Um, they, they invite, we went to the Tim Allen concert, right? So Tim Allen, the comedian. And uh, so we go backstage 
and talked to Tim Allen after the, the, the show, and I didn't realize how vulgar he was. He's yeah. like almost as bad as you. No, yeah. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> so, no, he, he was, he's like extraordinarily uh, it, funny as hell, though. And he's just talking shit about kids for like endlessly, and he's like, and I'm Santa Claus and freaking Buzz Lightyear, and I hate kids. I mean, it's the funniest thing. Because he does a voiceover. But then he's like, Kale. He goes, why the hell? And this was probably like a decade ago. He's like, why the hell is everyone eating kale? When did kale get a fucking publicist? Yeah. It was like, and, and, and Dave Asprey's like, kale is toxic. I mean, yeah. I, but again, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But uh, but the thing is. I do. So, it's toxic. Yeah. You're right. So, uh, so a couple things. Yeah. I met it's a fucking garbage. I met a couple that were in killer physical shape at at um, Chris Voss's, uh, one of this event that Chris Voss is doing, and they were, they were telling me that they were like sick for years, and they were drinking green smoothies every day, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, so what happened? We literally quit eating vegetables, and we just eat predominantly protein. And that, that was you know, a few years ago. And that, that it was seeing them, though, that struck me. But then I met Jordan Peterson. Uh, and so I w I'm talking to his wife, and saying they're here in Phoenix I go do you guys need any dinner recommendations he's like well, only if you know a place that has good steak and I actually told them to go to Tarbell's Mark Tarbell is downstairs yeah and so I gave him a Tarbell's restaurant and, and I go what else do you do you eat just like just steak and like you and Jordan just steak and I go like no fruits no steak and I got how long have you been eating just steak five years I'm like, you've eaten no other food items for five years but steak. And they're like, yep. I'm like, how do you feel? Oh, great. We have more energy than I go, do you take a lot yeah. of supplements? No, we just eat steak. And, I, and, I, I was, and I'm like around diet people. I'm like, it, it was the hardest thing for me to comprehend. Like, you, but, but it's only yeah. what we've been told. Yeah. Like, it's not, it's not like you feel great when you eat a vegetable or something like that. It's just we've been told for so long. Uh, there's... There's economic reasons for this. So, like, um, the the meat industry, a piece of steak, depending on how vertically integrated the company that's selling that steak is, uh, they get about three to twelve percent profit on on steak. So, and that's from farm to table. However, a box of Triscuits is a six hundred percent margin. So, the snack food companies pay for a lot of research that says eating snack foods is really good for you. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the American Medical Association, uh, especially the uh, American Heart Association, you know, they tell people to eat Cheerios to like lower their cholesterol. Fucking bullshit. That is not true. That's never been true. But they paid enough to buy off this organization. You know, it's unfortunate, but that's the world we live in. And you know, ultimately, does the US government want, want people to be eating steak? Well, 76% of people's incomes are controlled by the US government. So if you take Social Security, welfare, I realize they're completely different, but for the sake of this argument, the budget's being controlled by the federal government. So would the federal government rather give somebody who's on Social Security $20 a day so that they can eat steak and ground beef and you know pork chops, or would they rather eat Oreo cookies and noodles? They're going to go for the cheaper option, obviously. They can't afford the other option. So um, this is what I interviewed uh, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. last week. Um, and uh, that, that'll be probably put out on my social media next week. Um, like the decisions are being made so that people can be fed in a cheap way. And you think 76% of Americans have their income controlled by the government. Government does not want you to know this. Mm -hmm. And yep. they'll do anything to keep you from knowing this. I get a lot, I get a lot of censorship on social media, by the way. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do this. One, one last question, Michael, because we uh, for time. Sorry, uh, here's my uh, quick question. So working at hours, doing the thing long time, what is your sales pitch to, the, I get I'm going to do it to myself, but how do you convince someone that their whole life they've been doing working out hours at a time and we're going to do it now in 10 minutes a year or whatever it is, what is your, other than good, fuck off, hours. fuck off and shut up, does that make sense? What is the plan to take somebody, the athlete, D1 guy, playing in the NFL right now, what do you, how do you get that through their head? I would just love to see the psychology of this because okay, they'll mess with you question. a little. So, athletes 
want to do what's best. Okay. So they are the easiest people to convince. Okay. It's it's the it's the you know sideways hat gym guy. Uh, Got it. That's the one that has a lot of trouble listening. And you know if they if they ask a polite question, I'm like, just keep reading the stuff that I post on social media. It's free. So my question, I totally get that. My the psychology of the mental thing where someone's like, it has to be an hour, 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 has to be an hour. All that conditioning. Have you found a shortcut to get somebody? Th Me personally, I'm in. I'm, I sell myself in three. I'm already sold when you first started talking. Yeah. So my question is. How have you over the years found to recondition the non-athlete, the, I don't want to say average person, but just the room here thinking they all worked out an hour this morning. So I, I, I tell you. You I, get my I, question, correct? I understand your question perfectly. I don't target gym people. Okay. My market is busy professionals. Effective people. Yeah. Okay, done. Yeah. Like that's, that's like the sideways hat guy, he may never get it. Um, also, the thing that's that why Jordan you get the Mike Tommy sideways hat. It, it's something like, only 10% of the population can understand a new concept. The other 90% just follows along. And you know, they may think it's like, oh, it's like it was their idea the whole time. But very few people can understand a new concept. So basically, I knew if I was gonna change the world, and my plan is to change the fucking world. I want people to ridicule the practice of weightlifting. I want kids to sit there. I'll be walking by a park bench in 10 years and see some kids go, you know people used to lift like just like iron weights, like for fitness, like what a bunch of idiots. Like, that's my goal. I want people to really, because if everybody knew what I, what I know, they would never do that. And they would feel exactly that way. So ultimately, who do I have to target? Who's gonna change the world? The smarter people. So it's um, also people with no other options. I think about half of the long haul truckers in this country have an X3 in their cab. Like I've sold tens of thousands of units to long haul truckers. Because you, you ever see a truck stop with a gym? I mean, there's a few, like five or six. But if you're driving a truck and that's your job, like you're going to use X3. So they're sort of in a space where it doesn't really matter what they want to do. What can they do? And busy people. like. I don't have time to go to a gym, or I don't have time to like, you know, it's like, then you see this and it's more efficient, and then they read the science and they're like, I'll get better results out of that than I will out of going to the fucking Olympic training center. So I'll just do this. So it's, it's really just a matter of really trying to target people like the people in this room. Uh, also, if you want to join the discussion forum, there's 35,000 people talking about X3 every day on Facebook. It's just called the X3 Users Group. Um, you'll, it's like, it's like all physicians, lawyers, like it's, it's not gym people. Yeah. yeah. So let me say this. So yesterday John said to me, he's like, he's, you know, I asked him to come out as a guest to do an interview and share this. And he's like, you know, are, are you going to invite me to join this group? And I'm like, um, well, yeah, sure, you're invited to join a group. So he's literally joining Genius Hour. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so what I hope is that you all get an X3. You start utilizing it. When you see uh, John at the future meetings, you'll be able to ask him about stuff and then share, share this message with people. If you're getting results, share the message. Read his book. There's a lot of knowledge there. Uh, the, the, when you get an X3, there's also a video program so you, that they'll walk you through using it. You can you know, see the workouts so you're not like, well, well what do we do with all this? And, uh, there's video programming also on the website. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, we get out the book. Yeah, you'll be awesome. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and I'm gonna get his copy of his book for everyone. What's that? Yes. I mean an X3. You, you want me to get an X3 for everyone? That could that could be done with enough referrals into uh, <laughs> yeah into. Um, so, last question I'll ask you: Aside from your own inventions and stuff, what emerging trends, things in health and, and fitness are you most excited about, if any? I really want to get the message of, uh, for, for the people that need testosterone replacement, low dosage. Like you don't, it, it, it's more is not better. The right amount is best. And so, you know, like I, I had a meeting last night uh, with a, a pharmaceutical company that's gonna help me with this. Uh, they're, they're here. And so, um, you know, like, the guy almost didn't under, understand, like, well, what do you mean? Like, why would you want a low dosage? Because everyone thinks more is better, but 
it's it's not. It's also you know if you overeat protein. Has anybody ever had just like a like a big porterhouse, like a 40 ounce, just stuff themselves, and then you go home, and you're like, why am I covered in sweat? And so you turn the temperature down. I'm looking at you. I can tell you've done this many times. Oh, uh, like you just looking at me like, oh yeah, I've been there. So this is your body going into what's called thermogenesis because. Your body has no mechanism to store protein as body fat. This is why the whole like carnivore thing, like people get lean and they're super strong. Your body can't store protein as fat. So when you have more than you need, you just up your temperature. And that's how your body gets rid of that excess mm. energy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's another thing. When, when you get rid of carbohydrates, you're eating a lot of protein, you, you, really, can't, you really can't get fat. I, just, I, I, I asked you the last question. So my doctor, he's a buddy, and he's like, dude, I want you eating red meat as much as you can all day. Smart guy. And I'm like, well, okay, done. So I've been eating, and he's like, don't, don't worry. You could have shrimp. You could have other stuff. Stay away from potatoes. But he's like, there's only one protein I like. Every protein snack, every protein bar I've ever found is garbage. And so I get this, I, I don't know what it's called, but he's like, I only like one type of protein and I don't want you getting like maybe 10% from your shakes. He's like, I want you eating steak and then steak again and then steak again and at night eat steak. But try not to eat right before bed. And I'm trying to get casein before bed. But what are your thoughts on that? And then also the secondary question, this is my last question last two, is I, he said, don't effing worry about counting your calories. Don't worry about macros. Don't worry about any of that shit. Do not count calories. He's like, well, so, so literally, I've been on the scale for the last three months. I haven't gained a pound or lost a pound, but I got 12% body fat loss. Yeah. And he's like, wait till you see. He's like, I wouldn't be surprised if you weigh 240 and you get down to 10%. He's like, we'll see what your body does, but you're getting strong and don't worry about calorie deficiencies because that's bullshit. He goes, don't worry, don't listen to that shit. He goes, it's the wrong science. So I want to know, Supplementation wise, because everyone in here counting their macros and calories and someone's like, are you counting your macros? I'm like, no, I don't really do that. And I don't know, I, you know, there's a lot of different viewpoints. I just want to hear yours. Sure. Yeah. So um, I don't count anything other than grams of protein. Right. So one gram per pound of body weight. Uh, and then that's it. Like, and I can do that in my head. Like, you know, basically a pound of meat is a hundred. Um, 100 grams of protein, so I got to eat 240, you know, grams. So 2.4 pounds of steak a day. You, it's all steak. It's not. Use my. It's all steak. It's not the no shakes at all. Nothing. There, I do have a supplement called Fortigen, which helps. It's now it's essential amino acids, so it's like sort of the really targeted. Uh, type of protein that you're, essential amino acids are basically something you need to survive, they're a protein you need to survive, but you, you can't make them yourself. Like your body, the other 21 amino acids your body can make, or the balance, but there's eight that your body cannot make. So that's the only, uh, that's the only supplement that I take. I have another, there's another one that I came out with that uh, lowers the glycemic index of carbohydrates for those people who don't want to go like super low carbohydrate. Uh, it'll take a Snickers bar and it'll make it digest at the speed of a carrot. So like if you just don't want to give up carbohydrates, which is probably like most people, um, but you want to make them less likely to be stored as body fat, that, that supplement's called Citronium. Um, and uh, I have, there's like athletes that are taking you know, like a bottle a week of that stuff that uh, just lowers the glycemic index of carbohydrates. Um, I don't need to take that because I just kind of don't. Have let, let me let me also mention too, because I'm tracking my macros, as are all of us that are part of this physique transformation thing, and that you know, with guidance from Whitney Jones and stuff. And here here's why I think it's valuable. It, it, do I plan on tracking macros from? My, no, uh, I I don't. Uh, what it's done is it gave me a gauge of what I was putting into my body. 
and I didn't realize how much fat I was actually consuming because there's a huge trend lately, you know, fat is good, fat is good, and, but if you're, that all depends. All of this is contextual. What else are you eating with the fat, right? That sort of thing. And Dave Asprey was over my house last week and I literally made me and him food and he wanted some rice and I happen to have some rice because Dave loves rice, right? And Dave is like, you know, uh, kind of the inventor of the butter and coffee sort of thing, bulletproof coffee. And what, you know, hanging around Dave and people, over the years, too much almond butter, too much peanut butter, too much fat, too many nuts, too, there's just a lot of fat, like oils and stuff. And so the macros gave me a really great perspective of what I was putting on in my, in my body. And since I've been tracking my macros without doing anything else, digestion without sounding really gross, dramatically improved. Yeah. So, it, like, you don't know what the hell you put in your body if you're not, you know, like even tracking things, you just know. So, you don't have to do this forever, um, but, you know, so, and, and again, uh, all I care about here, there, none of this is a religion. I mean, you learn what you learn. I mean, how many of you learned something from this conversation that you had no idea about? Right, you know? It's this part, in this first introduction, there's a lot. You, when you read his book, you're gonna learn a hell of a lot more. There, you know, there's always things to discover. Mm -hmm. So, anything else I didn't ask you or anything we didn't talk about that we should have shared? No, I'm actually really impressed with the ground we covered. Uh, you got a question or are we done with questions? I'm just curious, why steak? Oh, why not, like, why not, we why got not uh, chicken or fish no, or uh, turkey? So, all that? Yeah, why why I mean, is steak the magic steak, protein? So you need to have uh, a significant amount of fat. Uh, so, like, all of your hormones are made of fats. Uh, the, the, for your nails to grow, for your hair to grow, I mean, that doesn't really pertain to us. But um, you know, like you need you need fats, uh, and so chicken is just too lean, and it just it just leaves you very unsatisfied. Uh, so fat, fats also what satiates you. Protein does a lousy job. Carbohydrates just make you hungrier. Now, the more carbohydrates you eat, the more carbohydrates you want to eat. Where it's like, you know, how many times have you said, well, I'll just have one slice of pizza, and then all of a sudden you've had them all, right? Like everybody's had a night like that. Yeah, yeah everyone. So it, it's, um, you got to have fat. Now, if I do have chicken, um, I'll put an excessive amount of butter on it. Uh, I might have some cheese with it because that, that's got some fat. But... Um, it's just easier to eat steak, and I like steak better anyway. So ribeyes? Yeah, ribeyes, so a higher fat content. I pretty we're going to have a special section just on steak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, the, next, uh, the next 10 minutes, talk, no, I'm kidding. So I'll give her a mic if we could. Here, let me uh, throw this. I only eat chicken, really. Yeah. And I eat like a stick of butter, I just, a day. Yeah. yeah. So she likes. She prefers chicken, but she washes it down with a stick of butter. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. In, in a way, like I can see the mixed faces. You guys are very. Don't. Nobody should play poker for money. I was here. at twelve percent body fat uh, too. <laughs> like you got. Yeah, I can just read your emotions right on your faces. So yeah, she got down to twelve percent body fat, which for a woman, this was for the Miss California contest. Um, it, it's like she did it basically by eating a stick of butter and chicken every day, and uh, she, it was phenomenal. Like her conditioning was like, and and maintained all her muscle mass because a lot of times, and you know, when when uh, anybody's getting ready for like a like a fitness competition, they usually lose a ton of muscle while they're dieting down. She didn't lose any, like not an ounce. Um, yeah, it's. It's a, it's a much different process, and yeah, I mean, you kind of have to, to get down to that level of body fat. You do have to starve yourself a bit, um, but, you know, it wasn't insurmountable. It wasn't torture. Yep. Uh. Awesome, man. This Thanks, is great. Guys. Thank you. Yeah. John Jaquish. Appreciate it. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful, so if you want to get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here, and if you want to watch some more videos that will be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead, get her over here, do it now. Come on, thank you, watch him.